Okay, um, this session is, is a session that, that is very close to my heart and it's one that helped me gain my National Teaching Fellowship last year for the Higher Education Academy. So I want to share with you heartfelt journey that I've been on for the last 10 years, but at the same time I also want to give you a bit of an experience of, of what, uh, what students uh, feel as they're going through a, a, a Brian Smith and, uh, session, whether that's research or whether that's looking at technology and so forth. Now this is me. Um, when, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, at Edge Hill University, uh, which is uh, a, a very thriving organisation uh, in the middle of Omskirk near Southport. Uh, we have just uh, almost tripled in size of footprint, uh, but we too have a very strong um, passion around e-learning as well as online education across all campuses. So we take the e-learning quite seriously. We look at simulation, the old method and the new methods, and we make sure that we imply, um, apply it to our um, practice. Uh, I also have a National Teaching Fellowship. I'm a University La La Learning and Teaching Fellow, uh, and I like to think technology enhanced learning is about the ology part, the study off, not about the bells and whistles, uh, more about the behaviorisms and the attitudes that we can instill in our teachers, but also how we can make sure we get the point across to our students for the future. <clears throat> My focus is on immersive learning. And what I mean by immersive learning, this is a 3D world for me, this room in itself. There's a number of things that are taking place on a subconscious and an unconscious level. And what I like to try and distill is understand what's in there and create that same effect for the students, whether it's in a classroom or whether it's online, distance learning. And also, my PhD that I'm studying by publication is about education without walls. And that will become clear as I go through this presentation. So, one of the things that uh, is of particular interest for me is how sound is sometimes mis uh, mis uh, le left off the actual presentation in any online uh, environment all, as well as the classroom. And th this particular sound will come back to you later on in this presentation because it signifies uh, that there's something important. When you get these presentation slides, there is something hidden in the slides that would challenge you to find out where they are and what those things are and where they are. And the, the Twitter feed that we have you can use during the session or afterwards to tell us what you found and where <coughs> any questions pop up for you. So this is divided into three parts of this presentation, scene setting. We're going to outline what we're going to do. Uh, and then there's an act one. And if anybody hates role play, don't worry, we're not going to do role play. Um, we're going to look at pedagogy. And we're going to try to understand pedagogy a bit clearer uh, for when it comes to simulation, especially online practice. <clears throat> Act two, we're going to look at the E part of pedagogy, the electronic part or the online part. So can you feasibly do a simulation in a physical environment that can be replicated in an online environment? Some people say you can, others say you can't, but it, we're going to try and dig deep and, and actually measure those conditions or identify those conditions that will help you do online simulation. So here's the outline. We're going to look at some pedagogy literature. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to touch on the fast growing amount of technology available to teachers, which uh, there's many of you will be aware of. There's certainly technologists in the room who will be aware of the plethora of technology out there and the confused state that we seem to be getting into sometimes, which one do we use, this one compared to the next. Um, but also the pedagogical application of the technology. And the caveat that I usually put into every presentation is it's not about the technology. It's about what you do with it, what you understand, what it will trigger, what emotions that you might likely trigger in an individual, what behaviorisms that you might be able to trigger also. So it's about what the application, the functionality of it can be within your pedagogical, pedagogical model. And that connects to the design principles. Uh, so it's what are the, the principles we are using with technology to simulate or stimulate <coughs> learning to take place. Yeah. Now simulation for many 
um, has been role play. But for others, it's something slightly different. And I'm going to try and make that clearer for you as I go through where my thinking is coming from. <clears throat> but first of all, so these, these are some of the theories that uh, I, I use in my pedagogical uh, approach to teaching and learning. Now, so, some of you might say these are old. Yeah, uh, if you look at Ghani, 1985, Ghani talked about the conditions of learning and he categorized them to the point that we were able to use them in the classroom and look at how cognitive strategies and motor skills and attitudes can be deployed. But we've moved away, with other theories, we've moved away from it. But what I've done is I've gone back to Ghani and said, if those conditions are evident in a good teaching session, in a classroom, can they be, tra be transposed to an online environment? Can they be transposed into a simulated environment also? <clears throat> We all understand that the pedagogical origin talks about leading the child, but does pedagogy today mean the same? It, 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 arguably, people would say it's morphic. I can take a poll in this room and ask, what does everybody understand by pedagogy? And I can guarantee you that I'll get at least five, six different answers. Some people will relate to content, some people will relate to theoretical concepts, some people will talk about showing by example, modelling and so forth. So what is it when we're doing online education that we need to understand about pedagogy? And what theories are we actually using? Now one of the theories that uh, I've, I've used over the years uh, inherently, or certainly since 2002, is Diane Lorillard's uh, theory around uh, conversational framework. Is anybody aware of conversational frameworks? Diane's in the University of London uh, and uh, a very eminent uh, speaker uh, who talks globally, a uh, very inspirational speaker. And what I like about her is that she really digs deep into what are the communications that take place online and how can they be categorised in such a way that you're able to take advantage of the anticipated communications. So in other words, if you've got a VLE, which I think your VLE is, is Moodle, it's becoming Moodle this year, you're transferring across, how are you going to take advantage of the, the uh, asynchronous and synchronous chat features in Moodle? What I found in my uh, research studies is that we expect conversation to take place. There's almost a, a right that if a, a student comes into a physical classroom, that we expect a conversation to take place, a discursive engagement. So we almost expect that as teachers when we go to an online a discussion chat room. But what tends to happen is students don't engage. Yeah? How many people have had that experience? Yeah, I've had that in the early days. And what, when, when I found that, I wondered, if, what have I done wrong? I started to take that personally. And that's one of, that was one of my behaviours that I had to overcome. Uh, and that was one of my emotions. That it, was, it wasn't me. It wasn't because I wasn't there enough for the student. What I soon realised is that the actual conversations that were taking place between me and the classroom were prompted by my presence, were prompted by my connection with the content. What happened in the online environment was that my presence was less in the online environment and it wasn't connected to the content. They were abstracts, they were separates. Yeah, so a few nods in the, in, in the crowd there. So what I had to do was go back to basics of what was my pedagogical model? How could I visualize it? How can I actually tie all those components together to create a constructive alignment? Yeah? Rather than, I'll do a bit of video here, a bit of chat here, separates, but they have to be connected. Yeah? So Diane Lorillard's Lure work <clears throat> looks at that different types of conversations that take place between peer-to-peer, student-to-student, student to teacher and predicts how you can actually take advantage of it in different settings for different purposes and means. So it's looking at the behaviourism but it's also triggering it off the conversations that you're trying to create. So I'm going to take you through this and, 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 and touch again on, on Diane's work because uh, you know she's such an inspiration. If you've never read her work or never listened to her speak, 
At the end of this slide, there's references and there's a link to one of our presentations at, I think it was EduCause uh, or Alt C. It's worth watching, definitely worth watching. Sir. Yeah. And we'll get access to the slides. Yes, you are, yeah. And uh, uh, that's, that's a hyperlink at the bottom, as you probably noticed, yeah? Yeah, you can link on that, the paper will come up and show you and, and so forth. Yeah, all the slides are on that website, so yeah. any, any other questions at this point? <coughs> Alan, any Twitter feeds? Yeah, we got one from, uh, about the, um, the golden eggs. You promised the golden eggs, you know, in your presentation. The golden eggs? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, we're all looking forward you know, to seeing them. Yeah, once you find them, once you have the slides and you've gone through the, the, the game of finding them and tweeting them to tell us where they are, we'll then send you a little prize. It may be a virtual prize or a physical one. So it's worth knowing your, your, your theories that you subscribe to. There's an abundance of theories out there, but it's worth looking at the theories that are out there and what they do um, <clears throat> so that you're aware of your own pedagogical model. Now, this might have come up last week uh, with, uh, Derek. Derek. Yeah, with Derek. You might have talked about this, this paper about assessment and feedback by uh, Nicola McFarlane in 2006. No? no? Did you not talk about this one? An exceptionally good piece of work, well worth reading, and yes, this one is hyperlinked too. <clears throat> Those are the seven categories that they identified. Now, when you read them, <coughs> you're probably gonna go, yeah, that seems fair, that seems common sense, that's acceptable, yeah. They are, and it's a, like I said, it's a very, uh, very good piece of work. <clears throat> but when you look at their, their model, they transpose it into this type of diagram. And what this diagram does for you is gives you some sort of feeling of how it's been constructed verbally, but also diagrammatically. And what, what this, this model does, uh, as well as many other models do, is they give you a generic approach or they give you a feeling of how they've done it, but sometimes it's more difficult to actually replicate when it comes down to yourself. What, what I I've, I've seem to have done over the years is be able to take a model and be able to deconstruct it slightly so that I can then say to colleagues out there, that, okay, you're coming from the perspective that you have a face-to-face -face session, perhaps on research, perhaps on sports therapy, per perhaps on business, or perhaps on psychology. You want to put it online. These are the simple steps. And we take them through simple steps so that it means that they are able to work with the technologist to actually get the strong pedagogical alignment that they require between content and theoretical processes. Definitely worth model look, uh, looking at, but it's about finding your own model. It's about finding your own visual imagery that's going to help you replicate the sessions each time for an online environment. Yeah? A model's only good when you can actually physically replicate it. <clears throat> so here's, here, here's my, my model. I'm going to lead into my model and where it comes from. And certainly with the simulated experience. Now simulation for me as a child was about uh, role play, uh, you know, playing cowboys and Indians in the garden, you know, playing football with mates, you were being a goal scorer for Celtic uh, or Rangers or who you're playing for. You know, you acted out that role because you, uh, you looked up to those individuals, you wanted to be those individuals. But I soon realized that role simulation or role play doesn't just happen in the physical football or cowboys and Indians game. It also happens in board games. Monopoly was a very good simulated experience for me when it came around to making money and finding a strategy to deal with income versus expenditure as I do now and many of you are in those positions. And what I loved was I always found my own strategy by going around the board game and waiting to read the players in front of me. I was looking at the faces and I was reading the visual clues as a child and I was able to predict the next move by that individual. So I would then skip them, go to Marylebone and buy Marylebone and then get around the board to buy Mayfair every single time. 
So, I, so there was a bit of me, my pedagogical model will start to form my head at a very, very age, uh, early age, uh, looking at behaviorisms and looking at s the psychological aspect of things. It also happened with the Rubik Cube. How many people had a Rubik Cube in their life? Yeah, we all did. Yeah. What was the outcome of doing the Rubik Cube? The outcome was you got the colors in the right order if you knew how to get the sequence, etc. Or the other outcome was you got frustrated and took it apart and threw it in the bin. Yeah? But what was happening there for me was another strategy started to form was about tenacity, about sustaining uh, power, but also a, 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 a distance effect of understanding what was the purpose. Yeah? And that's what our students do online. They, they enter into the online world and they want to know up front, what's the purpose of being here? Yeah? So when you're looking at a simulated experience, if you're going to use the Rubik Cube, even in an online environment, you've got to say up front what this is, the expectations are and what the end result is likely to be. We're getting into scaffolding, scaffolding learning. But scaffolding should be in such a way that it gives room for maneuverability and flexibility of the student's approach to learning. So, so back to the board games. Uh, these were very early for me, uh, and certainly backgammon and chess at school. I played backgammon and chess at school, and uh, uh, again, it was more like uh, a game of 3D poker because it was reading the player rather than reading the moves. Uh, so it, it gave me a, a great playground. Then I, I went into the healthcare background. I went to the health service. And this was probably the significant part of my career where I realized that simulation was extremely, extremely important. We had scenarios where a patient was being operated upon uh, for an, an aortic aneurysm, uh, appendicectomy, could be any subject, uh, sorry, any um, <clears throat> surgical area. Um, and we would we would uh, go through the, the real experience with the surgeons, we would listen to the nurses that passed the instruments, we'd ask questions, etc., so on. But then, when simulation came into practice, we tried to simulate the same scenario, but also look at the human factor elements, where mistakes occurred. Yeah, because you, you, you still hear today that sometimes there are errors in operations. Um, <clears throat> it, it was the same 20 years ago. What can simulation help to prevent errors for the future? Well, what I noticed when I was an educator was, uh, an, a, a clinical educator was that we, we mimicked uh, road, road traffic accidents in a room, an educational room, uh, much smaller than this. We mimicked them, but we left out vital information. And the vital information was the sounds. We, left, we didn't bring any sounds into the room. We didn't bring any passing traffic into the room because in the operating theater or in the roadside, there's passing traffic. So what we'd done was we took a real life scenario placed into a simulated room which was abstract from the real area and we left out vital information that started to make people dissociated from the learning experience. They weren't immersed in the experience, they were abstract from the experience. So I wondered, and I remember this quite well, I, had a, a bunch of medical students who would come in and would look at me as if to say, it's a dummy, you know, and, and what I was trying to say to them was, this is a dummy, this is a 48 year old individual who is about 70 kilograms in weight and has just suddenly collapsed. I was asking them to act out a role that was completely alien to them because I hadn't put them into that conditions, the Garnier conditions. I hadn't got them in the state that they felt immersed into the experience. So that's what I mean by the old simulation. The new simulation is about picking up all the, the senses, the clues, the sounds, etc., and putting them into the real practice today. Now, when you do that online, you certainly have to remember to put those experiences in place. You need the sounds. And I've got this theory as well that sometimes we try to take presentations, a classroom presentation, and we put it onto um, VLE, a Moodle, a Blackboard, or whatever you use, and it becomes two-dimensional. You lost the one dimension that's really important to most people. So it's about being cognizant of that and actually making sure that you try and capture everything that's in a 3D room 
and put it into a VLE or a 3D environment for immersive learning to take place, especially around simulation. It also gives you a chance, uh, you know, I certainly remember quite well in the healthcare days that there was that community of practice. We all knew what we were trying to do. We were trying to save lives. We had people around us, so we had a sense of togetherness, although that when we weren't together, there would be differences of opinion. So there was a real uh, bond or a real thread that kept us together in the real world, and we tried to do the same in the simulated world. Then, I, uh, as technology moved on, we were getting this sort of thing taking place. You were getting the hybrid approach between the technology, simulated technology, the real world uh, as well. So this was done in the real world, but not in a virtual world. And you, you had a, the, the PC that allows you to see inside. So this is a camera that goes into the knee. Some of you might have had this done for arthroscopies. So you're able to see what was actually inside the knee and operate on that knee before you actually go into the operating department and operate on a real patient. Again, the difference here was we tried to put this in a simulated environment, but no passing traffic, no sounds at all. Um, so you didn't get the same ambiance that you required to make that individual immersed. And, and many medical students would come in and do a little bit on the plastic mannequin and then walk away. Hopefully they'll have gained something to take away and apply it to practice. But instead, what we did in this particular hospital is we changed the whole simulated suite around so it almost become its own operating theatre. So it was walking into a real life situation, but with a plastic mannequin operating. So again, it comes down to the behavioural senses. Then I saw this. And I, I love faces, as you can probably tell. Playing the chess game, playing the backgammon, Seen those faces. I then saw this face, and I wondered what this face was telling me. And this face stayed with me for many, many years. Not this actual face, this is a, a stock image, but this is the expression that I saw uh, certainly in the 90s that stayed with me until recently I realized what it means. You would all agree that this looks like someone concentrating. Yeah? Probably someone engaged because of the way they're looking, the way their eyes are fixed. There's very little emotional response there, but there could be. The desire to succeed was another thing that was behind this. This was a, a surgeon operating. Those were the three, uh, the three, four factors that I extracted from that face. And I then thought to myself, what, what's that telling me? And I never worked out for a number of years until recently. That what that face is telling me is someone's immersed in whatever they're doing. What I need to do is create immersion in the same way. I need to create those faces on my students in an online world as well as a physical world. So I then start to ask myself these questions. Before we look at these questions, Alan, is there any other Twitter feeds that you want to raise? No? Okay. These questions have stayed with me for my whole academic career in, in higher education and also health education. So today I use these questions when I'm writing something for online. Uh, if I'm trying to uh, write a new course, uh, I will use these questions to provoke my thoughts. And you can see that the words uh, behaviours, emotions, rewards, Engaged and communicative comes up, uh, and the story. The story, storytelling has been around for a while. Storytelling is extremely powerful. It's still powerful. When you write things for online education, uh, I, I refer to it as the contextual voice. And the easiest way I can describe this to you is if you've ever read a, a, a child's book before they go to bed at night, there's some words on the page that tell a story, uh, but you fill in the gaps and you give the, the voices. You, you, you talk about the dragons and you talk about all so, sorts of things. You put the noises in. What you're doing there is you create the contextual voice that the story becomes alive and visual for the child before they go to sleep. When you're doing that for an online audience, uh, you need to do the same. You need to create the, uh, those sort of contextual voices that will tell the story, the compelling story, create the images, 
you know, make, make the words powerful enough to actually describe what the, the dragon looks like. <clears throat> and the, the, the bottom question uh, I, I keep posing myself is, how do I know when the students are learning? They're online, they're at a distance, I may not see them. I may not be able to phone them up, etc. So how do I know that course is working? Apart from the attrition rates and the results at the end, how do I know that each part, each week, that when they're online, how do I know that they're learning? Because after all, as teachers, what we want is feedback. We want to know we are good and we can do what we do. Yeah? Because when you do presentations, you never get the feedback that you get, do you? But you want it. You know you want it. It's an innate behavior that we have. So how do you know when you're online and the students online and the students learning? Because you, you need to tease out some of the feedback. Now, one way I've done this is I invite the students to actually do some problem-based learning uh, online. And what I mean by that is I pose a problem, but I pose it in soft language, not colloquial language, a soft language that uh, goes along the lines of Colombo. If anybody's uh, of the same age as me and remembers Colombo, the, the guy with the, the old raincoat, the American, the, the policeman, he would do this on his head and help me out here. Yeah, this cigar. And I use that type of approach. Hi, uh, you know, if, if I know the student's name, I'll say, Hello there. Uh, hi, it's Brian. Uh, I'm just having a bit of a problem here. I'm not quite sure what this means for me. And what I, I'm doing there is I'm, I'm reaching out to the students to say, help me. I don't quite understand. And when you throw out a, a, a call for help, students like to come back because what you're actually doing is you're, you're, you're leveling out the playing field on the power relationships between the <laughs> teacher and the student. So I, what I'm doing all the time is trying to open up the students so that they will give some, uh, some dis discourse and some feedback towards me. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I often find that students will write to me separately once they've answered things on the discussion board to say, I hope that was okay. And I'll write back to them and say, thank you for your contribution. It really helped me understand. Uh, so, so I'm looking all the time. I'm looking at the sub subtext of language. I'm looking at modalities of language as well to try and pick up with the keywords that a, a typical student would say to me and give me indications of if I'm doing okay. Um, and what I'm doing all the time with that information is I'm placing it into my pedagogical learning design. And this is mine. This is what I use every single time. Uh, and this, this came out of a piece of research that I did in 2005 that I published in 2006, 2007 and 2008. When I'm sitting down looking at writing things um, for an online audience, especially with simulation, um, I have a number of planned stimuluses. How do I get the audience engaged? How do I keep them engaged? I also have uh, the, 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 the point at the bottom here where it's communication. I'm looking for communication continually. I'm not looking for people to jump in and jump out. I'm looking for continual communication. So it's discourse. It's going to happen from the start. And I usually start at the beginning by saying this is a discursive session and it's owned by the students. So I'm setting up the state of mind for the students. The, the C part is content, micro content. Rather than just one session, what I've done is I've looked at micro content and I've showed uh, that there is a contextual voice all the way through. This. So there's a story being told by, by the text. And the story, and what's interesting sometimes is the story changes because the student changes the direction. So you, <clears throat> in problem-based learning, you might have four different directions, sub-directions. So a, a student would cho uh, choose direction one and it would go off on a different tangent. Uh, or, or two, it would be a different tangent again. So what we try to do is create some flexibility so that students can choose what's the right or wrong outcome of the scenario being posed. And at the top there I've, I've written arousing curiosity. That's, that's what I'm trying to do all the time. I'm trying to almost not give the information, give the end answer. I'm trying to give the information while asking for help. 
to come up with different concepts. Yeah? So I keep things a little slightly open-ended. But also, modeling behavior is important. So <clears throat> when, when I was doing this, this research stuff, um, to describe the classroom uh, scenario, I had students in the classroom. I had a camera on me. I had a microphone. But I had students, another 25 students online in different geographical locations. So what I was doing is modeling behavior. The students online could see the classroom scenario and they could see me, and they can actually ask questions uh, through Twitter feeds, but also put their hand up. They can actually verbally ask questions. So it's important to model the correct visual behavior, but also the written behavior too. So if I wanted to change uh, a, a, a student's approach to, to how they would problem solve, I would give an example of how I would do it. Uh, and what was quite interesting in the research was that students start to pick up key words and they would model those key words. They would actually use them <coughs> within their own text. I was also uh, keen to make sure that reflection took place continually uh, so that students had time to actually stop and think as they went along. So it wasn't just a case of here's the information, absorb it and at the end do some reflection. It was about reflection maybe apply back into practice, then come back again, ask further questions. And we, we ended up with this sort of jumping effect taking place. Students were not going through a linear approach, which initially was designed that way. Um, they were actually jumping back and forward. So when they got to the end of the course, what was really pleasing for me is people were going back to, to day one of the course and they were, they were actually saying that they were getting something different. They went back and done the simulations again. Yeah, so sure. Yes, sir. It's a content. It's content it's activity. Content. Yeah, it's um, activity or theory or. Anything. It, it, could, it could be it could be a learning object. It could be theory. Uh, what we we use the acronym is PAA. Uh, there's a preloader, so before they even get into the session or get to the classroom or online, there's some information for them to think about. There's an augmented stage, where they actually augment uh, aspects, and then there's an application stage. So. So each, each is micro, so it's not 12 weeks long, it, it could be anything. It could be down to 30 minutes, it could be an hour, it depends on what your model is. But it was good to see that students were going back and forth. So the scaffolding effect of being flexible was allowing them to move back and forth. Um, <clears throat> so, and I've mentioned already that what I, wasn't, uh, what I was trying to do is connect the people in the classroom to the online world. Hence why we use Twitter feeds here, uh, because both sets of environments have rich experiences, rich conversations to take place. And it just seemed uh, rather odd that we would keep the online students separate from the, the classroom students. It would be great if we can harness the collective intelligence by connecting them all up together. Yeah. And, and that interconnection, like I said, was done through um, a video camera and microphones. Now here's, here's some of the findings uh, that we, we found from that study. 35% of students who came to the classroom, so I started off with 70, um, 75 students in total, came to classroom. After week three, 35% of them had migrated completely to online. And so they never came back to another session again. Well, well, but they were still there, but most students. Uh, what they were seeing in the classroom was the same as what they were seeing online. It gave them confidence to go back and uh, do things online. And these were people, when you uh, dig into the, the data, these were people who were saying, I don't do technology. I don't have a computer at home. So these were real reticent people towards using technology, which was fine because not all students are comfortable with using technology. But it's interesting, 35% migrated. Uh, yes, sir. Some, uh, sorry to uh, some new tweeting in the coming through, and thanks for pointing me out. You know, I'm actually looking at the wrong Twitter um, area, so I kept reporting. You know, there's no Twitter. You know, coming through. Um, just a couple of um, observations. You know, um, and as well as question. I think one of the like to point out um, is about how do you keep the story going when you talk about storytelling. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, in terms of how do we know learners are learning, I think you're really talking about having feedback, you know, yeah. uh, both online and traditional form. 
And uh, the other one, if you may uh, talk about how do we need to justify, what's up, do we need to justify stimulating environments against traditional pedagogies if our approach is integral? Right. Would you like to move? <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one. The first one was... What about how do you keep the story going? Yeah, the, the, the story going for me is I, I, I usually sit down and write the story at the beginning and then I, just, I have um, additional triggers in the storyline. So please, please forgive me, if you look at the best soaps that are on television and look at the soaps, the soaps have a very long storyline over probably about three months but then they have some, some trigger points. Uh, the editors will take the trigger points and whatever way the, the viewing rating is looking at the soap, if there's a, a significant point on a soap that has hit the public and there, there's a, an outcry or there's a, whatever message is coming forth from the public, the, the trigger points will be worked up by the editor to follow that, that, that direction or go against that direction. So what I do is I look at having trigger points ready. So every week I come on and I might do one or two hours a week with students and I'll have a trigger point ready for that week. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I hope to see. And if I don't see it, I'll throw the trigger point in and it will encourage the students to come back and go, oh, that's a wild card. Let's, let's try and answer that. No. Some are medical, uh, some uh, are sports, uh, some are um, uh, MBA and business management as well. So it, it works across uh, different yeah. geographical centres. Yeah, yeah. So I don't work very well with medical cases. I used to, I used to do this at St George's with online um, public-based learning. Right. Because um, medical cases have a natural storyline. Do, do. Yeah. yeah, but of course you can apply to other things. Yeah. Thank you for that. And the second question? I think the second question is about um, do we need to justify stimulated environments against traditional pedagogies if our approach is integrated? So we're having a sense of whether do we need to have a different approach of physical environment or online environment? Does it, do we need you know, a, a different model of e-learning? Yeah. One of the things I learned from the, the research I did was that if I wrote the teaching session through the eyes of the online learner, someone I would never see and who might be 4,000 miles away, I, if I wrote it through their eyes, through their body, their feelings of emotions, and what would and stimulate them, I could actually apply the same pedagogical principles in the classroom. So every material I write, even for a physical session, I write it through a distance learner. How would this distance learner feel? So. The, your, your pedagogy can be the same, but you have to reconcile that there are slight differences with an online pedagogy with a classroom pedagogy. The classroom, you obviously use the, 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 the facial experiences, the, the movement on the seats, etc. whereas online you don't have that. You tend to create hyperacuity of, of the senses. You, your senses become more aware when you're online. So if your pedagogy is written in, uh, in such a way through their eyes, their feelings of a distance learner, it will apply to the classroom. If you do it from the classroom environment to online, there's always a mis mismatch for some reason. Um, so it, it can be the same, but you need to take in, in, in consideration all the senses. I guess, you know, uh, one of the experiences we had when we were in the team, um, an academic colleague gave us you know, a PowerPoint presentation and said, can you make it online? Um, could you just put it on, you know, on the blackboard? That's what we use. Um, so all our students from a thousand miles away, they can see my PowerPoint. That's e-learning, isn't it? And what we said you know, to our colleague is, would you expect uh, a student coming into a room and the PowerPoint you know, just play by itself without any interaction, without any prescription or, you know, or the contextual wrap and explain what they want to learn? Would you, how would you find that experience? And if you take that approach and looking at your e-learning design, you will realize, and you will give a little bit more description of what they're gonna learn in this session. How would I expect them, you know, after reading my PowerPoint presentation, do they, you know, have, do I want to have any feedback from them by maybe engaging with a dialogue, like what I'm doing with you, you know, at the moment? If so, 
then that's where you 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 find your answer. Apart from the PowerPoint slides, you know, alone may not be enough. Think about you know if, if you are talking to them as if you know in the class, that will be you know I think one of the kind of common you know uh, issue that we deal with you know when someone asking about their e-learning approach. Great, thank you. Just a couple of points in this slide that I really want to point out to you. One was a phenomenal uh, situation that happens that I, I never bargained for. Uh, the, the students in, uh, accessed the, the online uh, environment 22 hours out of 24. And I couldn't believe that uh, even students at 2 o'clock in the morning were online. I thought I was the only crazy person and didn't study at that time. But there was only a follow period that was two hours between 3 and 5. I still don't understand why, but students were finding that they can customise their learning experience when they wanted to do it. So, yeah, I had, I had students who weren't working night shifts or day shifts, or etc., but were going on at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, and what I was finding was that I didn't need to be there. They were actually engaging the discussion. They kept the discussion. They were developing the story. They almost got into story writing themselves. And that was a real fascinating occurrence uh, for me. Uh, so, and that's the point I was going to make about there was high communication with good modelling practice taking place. It was almost that the students had become the teacher. And this would relate to Jilly Salmon's e-moderating model, where you've got the five stages. But I think there's a sixth stage of Jilly's model, and I, I can say that comfortably because I think there's a peer teacher, peer mentor approach on that sixth stage where that once you've actualized it for stage five, you go beyond the rhetoric and you can actually do something much more fantastic by keeping it going. So just moving on uh, briefly, I'm conscious of time. Um, this is the actual pedagogy that uh, I, I, I realized myself through discussions with the team, uh, through uh, working with other people. And it was the one that was published uh, in 2008 uh, after being peer reviewed by the Open University. Uh, my, my, my approach here was about uh, changing the locus of control. And what I mean by locus of control is the experience is not owned by me. The experience is owned by the students, the masses. So I, what I was doing is I was writing the content, but I was saying, you're in control. And that was quite strange for some students, but that effectively that's what happened at the end of it. The design of it, etc., gave control over to students. I also... Uh, the, the significant part was about the creating the convergence between online and classroom, not as a mode of delivery, but a mode of learning. Uh, so it was about creating opportunities, spaces without walls, for individuals to actually learn. And making sure that the learning was context-centric. Context and what I mean by context-centric is that it, if you look at situated learning, if the best place to learn something is in, in business or in the operating theatre or in a primary school where you're teaching. That's the place that you place the context centric. So if you, you want as a simulated environment uh, to be set up fully, it needs to be in a context centric way. And it can be done online. So I, I uh, had three prongs to uh, the actual model. Uh, that the role of the tutor, the curriculum design and the communication for learning had to be balanced. If you take one out of the equation, it doesn't work. If you make sure that the role of the tutor is understood by the students as well as the teacher, uh, in that they will interject, they'll, they'll give stimulus, they'll arouse curiosity, they'll be there as a, a co-learner rather than a, a, the actual teacher themselves. The, you, you tend to level the playing field and the curriculum design creates this uh, um, contextual voice that tells the story as you go along which then stimulates the communication for learning to take place, the discourse between students. There is a link at the bottom uh, that you can uh, click on and you can go to to read the research paper. All this that created a lot of curiosity for me. You know, I was, a, uh, I, I was five years into higher education, really excited by uh, this phenomenon that was taking place. The uh, university was really exciting because it was something completely di different in innovation and we had the same aspiration as yourselves. They, we wanted to move a lot more into online education but we didn't know how to. So this model starts to be 
developed in such a way that other people were trying to capacity. But if that wasn't enough for me, uh, at the same time, I was playing around with Second Life. And Second Life, as some of you will already know, is uh, a 3D world, uh, a, a metaverse. Some people call it a game, but it's not. It's more than that. It's a real life existence, but in, in a virtual world. And uh, the, the thing about this, the, this world for me was it, was, it was giving me an opportunity to take the 3D simulation that I had in the physical world with medical students or uh, other students and try to take them into a virtual world that would m make a difference. Yeah. Now, that, at the time, the technology wasn't well developed. And I'm sure some of you will remember the conversations and uh, uh, people were a bit cautious on it. The technology was very bandwidth hungry, was uh, very graphic uh, hungry as well. And there was a lot of clunkiness. You were walking into walls, etc. So simulation became problematic. But since then, it's developed significantly to the point that here's me in my virtual home. And I actually use, uh, maybe I look a bit more slimmer there, I don't know, but uh, the, 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 the virtual world for me now allows me to interconnect with people around the world. Uh, so I, I, I do a number of presentations uh, from my virtual home. Uh, and the, the pictures that you see in the wall are actually designed by me because I'm an artist uh, as well outside. So I furnish this in such a way that it repl replicates my, my own physical house so I can feel comfortable to be able to do a presentation to Australia uh, or online or I can conduct business meetings. So I, I have a number of people who will meet me at a certain time in the Second Life environment and will come and have a virtual meeting with me. And it's, it, at first it feels different, but more importantly, it gets the work done and it helps me to actually make good use of my time. Now you might say to yourself, oh you can do that with Webex, or you can do that with Skype, or you can do that with any video conferencing. Yes you can, but the 3D world gives you a sense of presence, a sense of the avatars in front of you, a sense of a real person's behind it, compared to a two-dimensional picture just of an individual or a voice in your head. It gives you the conditions, the Garnier conditions of helping you be immersed in that experience. Do you want to say that? Yeah? Uh, telepresence. Well, yeah. It's it's not yeah. So I, I don't know any research that says what you just said, so I, I'm interested. Uh, what you just said was, if I understand it correctly, that telepresence is stronger in, in a 3D world like the Second Life than it is Correct. through Skype. And there's lots of research papers that we can share. David. What's, the, what's the phrase Harvard used, Brian? Snapping, snapping into presence. Snapping into presence. So you really feel as though you are there, not sat at your desk at home yeah. working your, your, your computer. Yeah. Um, I, I think you know, that's the real significant impact of that, that world, that you can create these places to go to and so kind of converse. This is interesting, it's disembodiment though. So you, you move from this <laughs> body into that body. Yeah. yeah. Into cyberspace. Yeah, yeah. Now, once you, get, uh, you start for the first hour, you, you're, you're, you've got this internal voice asking you, is this the right thing to do and so forth. But once you get into the, the second hour of your first experience, you become lost in, it, in the sense of completely immersed. Uh, especially when there's a, a, a dedicated intent and activity to do. So for me, it's about business, it's about doing conversations, it's about presenting. If there's a definite intent, I'm lost in there. And I spend about four hours a week in, in this environment doing business. Yes, sir? Sorry, it's fascinating, because then it's interesting about emotions. You talked about a lot of emotion in learning earlier, because then the emotion's actually in this body. And if I'm in there, where's the emotion? So I just concentrate in, yeah. in that. Yeah, okay. Lip synced, uh, the, the, the avatar's lip synced, uh, so when you talk, uh, it'll talk, uh, move, etc. And if you, uh, you can create gestures, you know, and sort of stand in different ways, poses, etc. Um, but also the, the hearing senses, you start to hear more uh, in, in terms of hyperacuity of, of the hearing senses. You hear people's undertones as well as the overtones. You, you actually hear more. And that, that was interesting for me because I never heard it before until I started using Second Life. Uh, and one of our colleagues in, 
in New York actually pointed it out even more to me recently that um, the senses become much more in tune with what you're hearing, so you can actually read between the, the context. So, so I tried it on <coughs> uh, my students. Uh, I tried it on my students. It sounds like I did a, a, a sort of a guinea pig approach. Um, and <coughs> I was finding that um, when we congregated in this particular area, and this is the work of uh, the Imperial College uh, in London, and they, they spent a lot of money de devising this campus, and it was amazing work that they've done. But they also invited people to come in and have a look, etc. So um, I, I used it a couple of times where I was able to have tutorials for students. So I had students in different geographical locations who didn't want to physically move uh, or drive to the campus. So we set up a time and date when they can come along with their dissertation uh, and they can actually discuss key parts of the dissertation and they would walk away feeling that they had an engagement with Brian. Uh, and those students felt very, very satisfied. But the, the thing with those students was that there was an element of conjoling and encouraging them to try something different. And it worked for them. And they came back and said, we want a bit more of this and more. So it was about agreed times, confidentiality that we had to consider, respect. And these are all things that relate to any online program or any online course. It's about making sure that you have an etiquette rules in place that are about confidentiality. You don't talk about uh, things that you shouldn't be talking about. And that there is mutual airtime for everybody else to say what they have to say. And so that's, um, the, here's just a few other slides that I wanted to show you before we break for a, a drink. So I, I was getting to the point that the, this was a real creative space, a creative opportunity for simulation especially uh, to take place. Um, and uh, it wasn't just about medicine, it was about any simulated experience that you could feasibly take from a physical world and transpose it into this environment. Um, my, my experience of law and order in the, in the US, uh, University of Central Florida, uh, used this consistently through their law enforcement, their policing um, uh, courses, where you can simulate a bar brawl, there's a casualty in the floor, they're being shot uh, with a, a gun, the student uh, law enforcement uh, individuals go in and they start a sequence, an algorithmic sequence of how to treat the scene area, how to pick up the, the gun and put it in the bag, etc. So all those things can be simulated in, in the uh, sequential manner. In, uh, in healthcare, we start to look at uh, things around healthcare practice. About uh, There's a heart murmur centre where you can go in and you can meet um, uh, the patients. So you're using patient stories where you can actually diagnose the, the patient by placing the stethoscope. You're the avatar, you place the stethoscope over the heart, you hear the heart sounds, you hear the basal sounds of the, the chest, etc. You then come up with a diagnostic and you've got your, um, your supervisor at the side of you who, who you turn to and you can actually interact and say this is the best thing for this patient. So simulation can be done, it's just about making sure that you've got all the right sounds, etc., and all the conditions in place. Then I start to realize I'm getting a bit fanatical about this, and I quite enjoyed being in this environment. What else could I do? Then I start to sail, and I, I'll, I'll be the first person to say I'm not a very good swimmer, so water is a problem for me. But in this environment, I was able to go and jump in the boat and sail off to a destination that I would never go to in the world, the physical world. But I was able to interconnect with people. I was able to meet other people. And it would be quite surprising if I told you that those pe people on the beach there, I actually met one or two of them and I chatted to them and found that they were academics in other institutions that I ended up swapping details with. So, Offline, we were having Skype conversations about potential research projects as well. So it was just one of those things that I was able to do in terms of building relationships. And, that, and that's what simulation can do as well, because there's a shared problem. Then I realized there was opportunities uh, for reflecting. And this is me in, uh, in, in my chauffeur-driven car waiting for the chauffeur uh, to take me to, to Paris in Second Life. Um, and I, I found this uh, 
particularly good for me because any individual today is, is a very busy individual. Uh, higher education is extremely busy, but how much time do you actually get to sit and reflect on your week, your activities? I find by going into this environment, the few hours a week that I, I have, I'm able to sit and reflect and ponder over things, but also play out different scenarios if I can rewrite history and go back into the, phys uh, the real world and actually do something different. So it gives me an opportunity to reflect and practice. And then it brings me back to, potentially, I can create these faces amongst my students. That concentration, that engagement, and the emotional responses, and certainly desire to, to succeed. Now this is an actual study done by a photographer, and there is a link, a link to this. This photographer uh, took these pictures uh, of people who were gaming, uh, into game of, uh, games, and identified those are style of faces. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to see those faces in my physical and online classrooms because it's telling me that they're in, immersed. Yeah? So if they're using a simulated environment to play games, we need to understand the gamification elements that helps us to take that into our higher education experience. So it gives them an epic journey. It gives them an opportunity to collaborate with other people, to find the, the golden egg, the hidden jewels. But if we can transpose that into higher education, we've got a real rich opportunity in front of us. And then there's, of course, this one that many of you in this room will be playing today. Candy Crush. Modern day Rubik Cube. Sequencing. Al algorithmic. Processing. Getting rewards. Feeling good about yourself. Feeling that your needs have been satisfied. Yeah? The makers of these games have a similar pedagogical visual model that they use. So they don't just come up with the idea and make the game. They have a sequence that says, what behaviors am I trying to elicit? Why am I going to stimulate the individual? Yeah. How am I going to reward them? How am I going to keep them in, in, invited and immersed in this simulated experience? Charming, yeah. Alan, any questions at this point? Uh, number of really interesting points you know, have been raised in the Twitter and, and some go to about, um, I don't know whether I read it correctly, uh, focus of control that go to student role clarity is key and being contact concentric is important. So very good con um, observation. And I think um, someone also interested about what would you say would be, is, it would be your avatar? In your second life, what would I say is my avatar? Yeah. How do you say your your avatar in your second life? And um, I think I've just got one um, something about interconnection in second life leading to real life collaborations. But I don't know what um, people's take on uh, maybe not in second life kind of level. Does mm. Does any of you play PlayStation Three game? No, your your anyone you know that they play Xbox. Yeah, we're, we're not going to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, um, not necessarily the same kind of environment, you know, um, in Second Life. But when I I admit, you know, I play PlayStation Three games, and I do play, you know, other kind of uh, Wii game. What I found is I may not necessarily be the character in what I see myself in the game. But I do log into you know a similar kind of environment where suddenly I become Lara Croft. I become you know a full <laughs> Formula One driver that I don't think I will ever become you know to. But I log into that kind of role play model where I thought every day I can't go into my Grand Turismo game and I will compete in a different level of competition and. Should I reach you know, a certain level, I got a reward either by points or I will get the reward you know, by um, ability to drive you know, another car. So that kind of ha can be interested you know, to go, keep going back you know, to the game and try to become you know, what 
I want it to be. So that may not mm. necessarily the same kind of environment or impact on the second life, but I think the gamer and using a very similar model and trying to engage you know, with the player. So that's, and that, that's, that's human existence. We want rewards. We want to feel that what we are contributing to, whatever conversation that we've got has been heard, but also been acknowledged. And we look for that feedback. And that's what you're, you're referring to. And the levelliness of challenges as well is important. Certainly in an online environment, you need to make sure that it's not just one level of challenge, it is stepped change. So when they first get into the environment, that they want a nice, easy, comfortable into it, and then you want to start stepping it up so that it gets more, not more difficult, more challenging for them so that it keeps them immersed. Because if you keep it level, they'll lose interest. Yeah. These are some of the questions I still have, and I still want to resolve. Yes, this, this lady. the avatar that you're talking to. Uh, for instance, one exam one experience that I had was I thought I was speaking to you. You mentioned earlier that you, you met an academic in second life. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought I was chatting with an academic in, in, in the Harvard University, yeah. actually. But I found out that he wasn't an academic in Harvard University much, much down the line. It was actually, you know, just an avatar. A UK who lives in the UK, right. so and, and you know, yeah, we find that out later on. So there's this issue of not knowing who you're actually talking to, or not being sure that who you're actually talking to is is the person that that, that you think it is. And if you now translate that to students, mm. so you don't know if it's your student that's actually in your session. That, you, you know, that, that can, and anybody can just come in and walk in yeah, into your session, yeah. unless you make it a closed island or something. Yeah, I, I got, got a point, Julie. Really. Um, in Second Life, you have First Life and Second Life Profile, so you can actually access the First Life Profile. Uh, and if there's nothing in there, the first thing I'm going to do is probably ask questions about uh, that individual. And I'm looking for telltale signs in the language and the, the text that they might do on the instant messaging to tell me. So it's about reading the submodalities, the subtext of the text to see if there's congruence between what they say in one line and they say in the next line. So that's about getting into the, the psychology of language and actually digging deep into it. And David's agreeing there. That's what helps me understand, yeah, there's a connection here, this is congruent, or I need to challenge this. Um, but I, I, I do rely heavily on the first life profile. And that, um, the, the second point you were uh, raising there about students in a VLE, for, for example, in Moodle, how do you know that your student is the student in, in Moodle? Um, the, the point there is you don't. You hope that's the right student because the, the student is there, signed up and signed a declaration that any work that they'll put forward uh, to the university is their work. Uh, and, not, and if they put someone else in there as themselves, they're running a risk of being, um, well, being removed from the program. But hopefully, again, that gives you a chance over the weeks to actually look again at the text, the language that they talk in, in second, uh, sorry, in the VLE. So again, you're analysing the text all the time. And what I've noticed, uh, certainly in 2004, 2005, was sometimes there's an alteration between language. You can tell the difference between one person's language and another. If it's not consistent in every single thing that they blog or post, you've got a chance to go back and just query it. Yeah. So I do take your point. Uh, a closed environment would be better, but there needs to be uh, more. More. We need to be more aware of uh, the building up profiles of the individual's language as we see through text. David, did you want to say anything? I think it's a really important, fascinating question that you raised. This whole arena of emotional intelligence. And, you know, bring ourselves into the real physical world. If we're all honest with one another, you know, we've all been hoodwinked and duped in our lives by some slime ball we've met who appears, you know, straightforward and honest and decent, but you know, sometime down the line, I say you find out that this person is is this complete slime ball. And it's it's what can be done, you know, what can be helped in your arena 
education to make these youngsters when they come into the world of work more deft, more smart, to, you know, if you wish, give them a street wiseness that when they are dealing with the realities of what life is like in organizations, you know, they can see who's going to dump on them from a great height or who's going to be more supportive. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, uh, I think it's, I, I, you can't argue that um, being immersed in something is a very good way to learn. Yeah. Um, like, for example, going to Spain to learn Spanish. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Than that. um, and I, I was interested about simulation because my dad was a pilot. And okay. that, of course, is, for me, that's the epitome of immersive learning. Yeah. You know, the, um, um, simulators that you know, he had to use those years ago you know, when I was growing up. So, um, um, but what's crossing my mind here? I, I'm not, I, I work in, I, I love technology, I'm an early okay. designer, you know, I'm pro, you know. But there is, that question keeps coming up of how much time, energy, and expertise uh, okay. you need to create these environments that make people feel immersed. That's okay. my first thought. Because um, Second Life is, takes up learning's entire job, yep. isn't it? Yep. Or has done. Yep. Very huge building. But there is a learning, there is a learning for yeah. the initial learning. And you're going to have these academics coming in going, well, I want, you know, I took it with you, I want to give my students all this immersion. Can I do it by clicking my fingers? You know, yeah. that's yeah. the question. Um, the other thing is, I've been working on a course that's about study skills, very basic study skills, you know. So, I developed these, um, they're PowerPoints, but they you made me think about these because they are PowerPoint shows. So I've taken the notes that the, the uh, lecturer's notes and added to the PowerPoints to make them work on their own. Mm. So I've done that. Um, what can you say? Um, but some of the subjects are quite dry, you know. How do you do, how do you paraphrase? You know, all those things. How do you avoid plagiarism? Um, how do you make an immersive yeah. learning experience when you're teaching something very dry? Okay. First of all, um, I'll answer the question about time. Um, what I found is that I, if I wrote things through the model I was using, with short uh, contextual voices, the storytelling, I would wouldn't go and write another PowerPoint presentation for a classroom. So I write one that feeds all. I would then go to people like Alan and say to them, here's the functionality that I would like to create, and this is how it connects into the behaviorism that I'm trying to elicit. And the first thing Alan would say to me is, right, okay, you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, that has that functionality, but what's the right one? And we would sit down together, and he would help me work through what I'm trying to uh, create in the student at the end of that experience. And it's only at that point I can then say, right, Alan, you're right, let's lose that, use that technology. So it's the partnership of using that technology. And so typical of my sessions will be, there's always a Twitter feed. There may be a bit of video. There may be a bit of a simulated scenario, but there'll be web, uh, web broadcasts as well. Uh, people from different geographical locations broadcasting in, and there'll be a problem-based scenario. Uh, so what I'm looking there is to try and interconnect them all together. And if I cannot interconnect them, I've got a broken pedagogy. So I, th I then uh, put them together. I will then sit down with colleagues like Alan and a few academics and ask for a critical friendship. And we'll take someone through it. And if they don't get the anticipated outcome that I'm expecting, the behavior and emotional and, and so on, I then have to go back to the drawing board. But we've got it down to a fine art now that we can actually write these things. And, and, and that's why I'm so delighted that I've got these people to actually talk to because you know, Mark Prensky, you all heard of Mark Prensky, the, uh, the professor in New York. He said for every academic, there should be two technologists. I like to hear that because that keeps my job going. Okay. <laughs> we got more. But, Alan, you go nowhere. <laughs> but um, just to respond, you know, to um, some of the, the challenges, you know, when uh, people said, guess what, you know, this is a very instructional thing. There hardly any humor you know, excitement, you know, going to how can I jazz it up? Can you guys uh, think of some good images, you know, that you can put it in? 
And my response has always been, you know, as a graphic you know, designer, what do you think, does the image help to tell the story? If so, yeah, put it in. But if it's not, it's just a kind of decorative element. Yeah. It's not important. But think about, you know, I think when we talk about the journey, um, recently we developed um, a session for palliative care, and it's actually about um, giving consent to research. So if was, we would like to encourage um, nurses to help us you know, to conduct this research. And this is the PDF, uh, what they need to you know, go through. Can you make it an interesting e-learning session? Uh, uh, um, well, I said, first of all, what would you like you know, them to achieve at the end of it? Do you want, to gain, want them to gain new knowledge? Or these are already experienced people? I said, well, actually, they've already done you know, some work. It's almost like a reflection. That's why I think you know, PDF will do the job. Um, then will our team sit together and we think about, you know, what about some scenario? Can we do some scenario you know, to help them? Instead of telling them, this is what you need to do, give them a scenario. Ask them, can you point out you know, the area where they can you know, apply this knowledge? And from the session, we, um, we, we also in, in inject you know, kind of reflection point, stop and think. You know, if from your own experience, if this come up, what would you do? This is what the guidelines said, but in your real working practice, can you achieve this? So the whole session, you know, the way we do it was uh, we asked a couple of academic colleagues to act as a, 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 a as a props, and I basically used my mobile phone to take pictures and I put it in almost like a comic strip to show, you know, to tell the story. So that's tasty, you know, from our response of the user, they find it uh, more engaging. They say, you know, we can all read the PDF, but how apply knowledge, that was the um, enjoyment, the, 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 the kind of fun in that particular session mm -hmm. to test out what, what we, we read, you know, from there. Can I apply this, you know? So we may not be the grand scale of Second Life as such, or 3D, and our, because of the resources, we can only do the cheap and cheap, of, you know, both. So we do a comic strip. So that's, I think, one of the approach you, know, you may want to consider. And instead of telling them, delivering, you know, the instruction, but giving them a scenario, giving them a context, ask them to debate it, get them, you know, um, work through the practices instead. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, before we move to a, a break, uh, just to give you another example, um, the University of Sheffield has uh, used um, iPads uh, with a piece of software called Erasma on it. So students come into the simulated environment with the iPads and they run the iPad over the mannequin. And the mannequin comes alive. It's actually a person that talks, etc. They run it down the body of the mannequin and they can see where the problem uh, resides. They can actually see the anatomy inside. So there is some tools out there we can actually show you later if you want to. Um, uh, you know, I think those are real innovations because it brings the, the physical world and the online world together uh, in a cute way. And it's in, inexpensive. It doesn't cost much. Okay, that's enough for us at this point in time. There's, there'll be other thoughts and other questions that we can have, but let's have a drink and let's keep talking, and there'll be an activity uh, as we come back just to try and deepen this a little bit further, if that's okay. So thank you for listening so far. Thank you.